Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. And today we have Dr. Olga Kovacek, who uh, will be speaking to us on the topic of medical cannabis against COVID-19 from research to clinical use. During this time of social and physical distancing, SACPA believes it's important to keep engaging with the public on issues of the day, and in order to do so, we're very thankful to the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Um, let me just introduce our speaker today. Dr. Kovacuk is an internationally renowned leader and an expert in epigenetics and epigenomics of health and disease, environmental epigenomics, and radiation biology and oncology. See, she is studying mechanisms of disease, epigenetics, novel precision medicine approaches, and novel cannabis-based disease therapies. Dr. Kovacuk received her BMed and her MD degrees at the National Medical University in the Ukraine. Currently, she's the professor and a board of governors research chair in epigenetics of health and diseases at the University of Lethbridge here in Alberta. Uh, here in Alberta. Thank you very much for joining us, um, Dr. Kovacuk, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, actually also thank you very much for keeping up uh, doing what you're doing during these very difficult times. It's very important that we as communities stay connected and, you know, try to be, you know, as close to norm as possible, even though now we call it a new norm. I really hope that very soon with the research advances, we all will go back to what we consider normal, old norm thus far. So today I will talk to you about <clears throat> most recent research, actually really the most recent developments uh, that we had in our laboratory, uh, specifically how and whether or not we can use medical cannabis to fight COVID disease. And actually, I will uh, actually talk a lot about very fundamental basic science because before we actually move any treatments forward, it's actually very, very important to conduct that background research work to understand what's happening, to understand whether or not uh, various medical, um, you know, let's say various medicines, uh, for example, and the same thing is true for cannabis, are actually active. What are they doing to our cells? What mechanisms do they affect so that we can make a very important informed decision and move it from these mechanisms into what we call evidence-based medicine? So next slide, please. So. On the next slide, do we have the next slide? Yes, we do. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. So on the next slide, what we see are the, the picture of how the virus looks. So here is this little monster that has been wrecking havoc around the world. So the virus is wrapped in a very special envelope and has this little protrusions that stick out of it. They're so-called spike proteins. These ones the virus uses to initially interact with the host cells and the host is actually being us. So next slide, please. On the next slide, what we have is the comparison that was done very early during this, uh, during the development of this, what's now pandemic. This was still at the time of epidemic when we were trying to compare uh, what is SARS-CoV-2 about. And the, so SARS-CoV-2 is the virus and disease it causes is called COVID-19. So oftentimes people use COVID-19 for the virus interchangeably. So actually COVID-19 is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. So there are lots of viruses around us. And of course we know some are extremely deadly and such as for example, Ebola virus. And we know that case fatality rates can range between 25 to 90%, which is absolutely terrible. Smallpox is extremely deadly. Up to 40% of people infected with it die. And coronaviruses actually are kind of, you know, next in line of very, very deadly viruses. And this is not the first coronavirus to hit us. The first one was, um, the first ones were two, the SARS, the first one, 
because now this one is called SARS-CoV-2, which is SARS coronavirus 2, and MERS, the uh, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome of Coronavirus. So MERS had mortality rate of 35%. The first epidemic of SARS was ranging between 10 and 16. In comparison, polio, diphtheria, they were talking between 5 to 10 and you know 2 to 5%. We are still not 100% sure as to what the overall mortality rate for SARS-CoV-2 will be. Why? Because we really need way more data, we need way more testing done so that we actually come up with the final numbers. But overall, right now, I don't think it looks as high as MERS, definitely, probably much lower than SARS, but still much higher than the, you know, discussed influenza virus, how oftentimes people say, oh, this is nothing, this is nothing. It's just a tiny bit worse than influenza. Well, it's not a tiny bit worse than influenza. It is seriously more complicated. So how does this virus enter into our bodies? Next slide, please. So on the next slide, we have a picture of how SARS-CoV-2 interacts with very special proteins that are actually embedded in the membranes of our cells. So if you look at, the, uh, at this picture, very nice depiction by R&D systems. So we have cell membrane and the little green structure, like a crisscross, but a little green structure there is the receptor. The <clears throat> angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 is the special protein receptor that sits in our membranes and it's very abandoned in the tissues such as our oral cavity epithelium, nasal epithelium, epithelium of our, of our respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract like lung epithelial cells, as well as intestinal epithelial, also comes in kidneys and uh, in testes and so on. But overall, this abundance of this receptor in the upper respiratory tract in intestine essentially makes them what we call them the gateway tissues. Why is that? Uh, and of course, this, this receptor is there for totally different reasons, not there to catch the uh, coronaviruses. It has a variety of other important functions in the cells, albeit for coronaviruses, for SARS and for SARS-CoV-2, it is the gateway into our cells. So the little protrusions, those that I mentioned before, those spike proteins, interact with the receptor. And once that interaction happens, then the virus essentially is pulled in into the cell. So it's like engulfed, enclosed by the membrane, and it becomes the part of our cell. And then what happens, then the virus will shed its coats, get to its genetic material, and will use our cell's machinery to replicate, to make more of itself, and to produce its own packaging so that it can, again, put on these coats, leave the neighboring cells, and try to infect more by, again, interacting with ACE2 receptor. So next slide, please. So on the next slide is just essentially another depiction, but what it shows a teeny bit better that the virus, as you can see, carries something that looks like little beads on the string. This is actually to depict the viral genetic material. So the virus carries its own genetic material that's in this envelope. Once it's in the cells, the envelope is shedded, genetic material of the virus is used to make more of it, and also used as a blueprint to produce that very code. So that is how the virus gets in. So very interesting aspect. Um, when we discuss, for example, in, in biology classes, when we talk about what is life, we always mention that actually the viruses are not the smallest forms of life. As such, viruses are not alive. They are, when they are outside of our cells, they are not alive. Why? Because they cannot replicate. They cannot reproduce. So if they're on the surface, for example, if we drop 10 viruses on the surface, they will stay there and then later on they will disintegrate or spray them with something and they'll die. In order for them to make more viruses, they need to get into our bodies and only then they become capable of reproducing because they hijack our machinery in order to make more of themselves. So next slide, please. The next slide may look a tiny bit complicated, but you know I know that some of the researchers may be also looking at and in general, if you're interested, you can take a look. There is a um, uh, reference here to the Journal of Clinical Investigation, 
very interesting article that talks about what is happening and what is different between moderate COVID and severe COVID. Because what's important about COVID-19, it's a very interesting disease, it has a spectrum from people who are absolutely asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms to people who have moderately severe to moderate disease, they will cough, they have you know signs of you know even pneumonia beginning, to people who develop very, very severe disease and need the ventilator and oftentimes pass away. So what is the difference? And the interesting difference is in how our body responds to it. So something that we call severe COVID, and you may have heard the abbreviation ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So that is the one that puts people on the ventilator. So why do some people occur, why does it occur in some people and what is it? So what occurs is something we call the cytokine storm as shown here in the severe COVID-19. So when our body, our immune system, tries to produce every possible defense and goes almost into an overdrive, and it's huge overdrive, it's almost like, I don't know, for the lack of a better analogy, carpet bombs everything, trying to destroy the virus, but in the meantime, it starts destroying our own tissues. It is starting affecting our uh, and it's specifically important, for example, when it, when it affects the lung tissue, it also has been shown to do cardiac, uh, to, affect, to cause cardiac toxicity and whatnot. So leading to actually acute respiratory failure, organ failure, and death. So what happens is our immune system overproduces huge amounts of certain molecules. One of them is called IL-6, and you can see it there as two arrows going up, which means it's very significantly elevated. So IL-6 is called interleukin-6. It's a pro-inflammatory molecule. The other very important one is abbreviated as TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and other very, very important pro-inflammatory molecule. These very same molecules are implicated in a lot of autoimmune and autoinflammatory disorders, such as, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, such as uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis, such as Crohn's disease and whatnot. And so essentially, there are certain similarities in the mechanism between uh, very severe cases of those autoinflammatory diseases and ARDS. And the similarity is the so-called cytokine storm. But of course, cytokine storm is, I don't know, 100 times higher than in autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases. Albeit, the drivers are the same. And if the drivers are the same, that opens the window for the therapeutic opportunity. If we can explore medications or remedies that could curb IL-6 and TNF-alpha and other members of the cytokine storm. So, next slide, please. We have been working in the field of medical cannabis for several years under license of Health Canada. And primarily what we were doing, we were trying to develop new strains of, of medical cannabis and understand their medicinal properties, trying to see what exactly they are doing, what specific diseases they can be useful for, focusing on cancer, focusing on autoimmune anti-inflammatory diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriasis, skin diseases, whatnot. And we have been testing the properties of those extracts using uh, special 3D tissue models. If you take a look at this slide, these are what we call human artificial 3D tissues. Epi-oral, like oral epithelial tissues, epi-airway, they, they are essentially model of airway epithelial tissues, and epi-intestinal, they're model of intestinal tissues. They are produced by a company in, in Massachusetts, Cogmat Tech Life Sciences, and are very, very close to, uh, you know, if you look histologically, to exactly how the human tissues look like. Special technology that they, that they use, akin to the technology that was developed for um, production of skin for skin grafts, like, you know, artificial skin that people can produce in vitro to uh, try to treat people with severe burns. So what we have done, and we have done that before COVID hit, we were just kind of essentially, I shouldn't say lucky, but essentially lucky to be there with that data set that we could mine and carry on from there. So what we will do, we will induce inflammation in these tissues, and then we'll try to treat them with extracts to see whether or not inflammation is affected. But in the meantime, we accumulated this huge amount of data, and when COVID hit, 
and it became apparent that ACE2 may be the receptor. My first thought was, let's take a look whether or not any of our extracts affect the levels of this receptor. Because if we can, for a certain period of time, decrease the level, downregulate the level of receptor in our gateway tissues, and these are our gateway tissues, then maybe that could be used further for potential prevention strategies. And the next slide is most certainly very science heavy. But what the next slide tell us is that in, you know, in green, the bars in green indicate the changes caused by application of different extracts. The numbers like 1, 7, 9, 45 are the numbers of extracts pretty much out of our collection. And what you can see, and I'd like to um, specifically draw attention to panel A, two lines, 81 and 30, decrease the level of ACE2 as compared to the levels of the red bar. Why we compared the levels of the red bar? Because that is the level induced by that two DNF alpha, that inflammatory molecule that I just mentioned previously. So, and if you take a look at the panel C, again, you will see that a lot of extracts will decrease, actually not a lot, like, you know, six out of eight here, no, pardon me, six out of nine here, will decrease the levels of ACE2 on the level of its protein. The A and B were on the level of its gene expression, and, a, and, and lines in panel C is on the level of the protein. On the next slide, we took a look at what happens in the, uh, the previous two slides, pardon me, I forgot to mention, where in the oral tissue. This slide shows us what happens if you treat the airway epithelial tissue with the extracts. And as you can see here, three extracts, specifically 5, 10, and 31, did really good job in decreasing the level of ACE2, albeit the other extracts actually did not do that job. The extra number 49 and 114 were almost significant, but the other ones actually did quite, we can say, quite the opposite, which is, again, very interesting conclusion. You cannot say that any cannabis extra will do the job. Some will be beneficial and some may cause detrimental effects. So next slide, please. So on the next on the next slide, what we see are the changes in the intestinal tissue. And there, on the panel A, these are changes induced uh, on the level of expression of genes, whereby the most significant changes are caused by extract number 45. If you look at the level of the protein, there you see the changes that are induced by, again, more additional extracts. And you can see also the activity of extra 45, as well as 1, 7, 9, 129, and 169. But again, extra number 45 gives the results that are the most pronounced. So overall, when we saw these specific changes, we also tried to see whether or not, and this is on the next slide, um, the other protein, it's called TMPRSS2. And if you ask me why it is called so, it is an abbreviation of what it's done. It's a special protein that helps um, the ACE2 to bring the, essentially helps to, overall helps the cell to bring the virus in. And we looked just on the level of gene expression, and what we have identified is, again, some of the extracts were able to decrease the levels of this important protein as well. So ACE2 and TMPRSS2 are very, very important for bringing the virus in. And so what we concluded out of those data that, number one, some extracts may be used to modulate the levels of these very important gateway proteins. And why is that important? Because they can be further studied to figure out whether or not breaking down transiently for some time uh, the levels of this receptor, for example, in your mouse cavity or in your upper respiratory tract, will lead to the decreased levels of or decreased or, you know predisposition to infection almost like it can be used as a preventative strategy or whether or not it could be used to decrease the severity of the disease why would that be because remember i said virus gets in 
tries to make more of itself get out and these new viruses bind to more cells. So, but if we transiently inhibit ACE2 in the neighboring cells, maybe the virus will not be as, you know, as a kind of able to, again, infect the other cells. And that may potentially may make the disease um, course lighter. But those, of course, and most certainly, have to be ascertained in a form of clinical trials. And this is what we are now working kind of, you know, full speed on, looking for partners who, you know, together with us will, you know, develop, for example, mouse wash or mouse gargle or something akin to medical nebulizers where we can see whether we can affect the uh, upper respiratory tract. Next step of our study, and this is on the next slide, and you can say, oh my goodness gracious, this is such a complicated slide. So, the key take-home message of this slide is that after sifting through a couple of hundred um, extracts, we narrowed down to about a dozen, and then we looked into actually here, we looked at the, uh, at the effects of seven extracts, specifically focusing on these molecules, on those pro-inflammatory molecules that participate in the cytokine storm. So these eyes are called the storm clouds. The two key ones, TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, are here depicted as red bars. So as you can see, some of the extracts, like number four, number eight, number 14, really very significantly decrease the levels of these pro-inflammatory molecules. Together with the other molecules, let's not go much into detail as to what they do, but again, they are very important inflammation markers involved in that cytokine storm. And some extracts, like extract number 15, did nothing, there were no changes that were induced, as if nothing happened. Whereas the other extract, and this extract number 12, alarmingly did something we really didn't want it to do. It actually increased the level of IL-6 and increased some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this was quite an interesting finding for us, again, signifying the fact that cannabis is not generic. In the other words, if you would say, oh, how people say, oh, cannabis can help COVID. Cannabis is not cannabis is not cannabis. There are so many different strains and varieties. And what's crucial is to find the right strain with the right effects. Because if you, if you maybe remember from previous slides, just accidentally go and don't hit the right strain. What it will do, it has the ability to do exactly the opposite. Something we don't want it to be doing, like this strain number 12. Pick this tree number 12, and now the six goes up. And do we know what is it doing? Probably not very much, not being very much helpful. Whereas number four, number eight are actually really excellent in terms of uh, the very significant effects that it, caught, that it does on inflammation. On, line, on the next slide, what we see is, again, we looked also at the level of proteins, and we can see that, for example, the uh, Interleukin-6, the main perpetrator of the cytokine storm, is significantly increased if we treat them with inflammation increasing factors such as UV. And the extracts 4, 6, A, so on, do decrease it. But look again at extract number 15, does nothing. Quite the opposite. It looks like it kind of increases it or if anything brings it to the same, kind of, you know, to the same level as almost induction by inflammation. And on the next slide, and I will, let's flip through them quickly. So look at the nine, line, line number four. The green means decreased levels. And these green um, squares that are filled are actually the specific molecules that were affected in this pro-inflammatory cascade. And if we flip to the next slide, and this is slide number uh, line number 12, as you can see, everything that was in green now here is in red which means the expression of these genes goes up. So one line decreases them, one line increases them and brings them up. And if we take a look at the next slide, here I put them kind of together because they were slightly smaller. These are the molecules that are involved in what we call respiratory arthritis pathway, but these very same molecules also play the role in other autoimmune anti-inflammatory disorders and specifically in cytokine storm. So we see the key molecules that are down-regulated by number four are in green. And what we do want to do, we do want to bring them down because we want to bring that inflammation down. Whereas line 12 is actually bringing them up. So again, this signifies the fact that number one, cannabis is not generic. 
it is important to study it, to study it rigorously, to go through preclinical data, to understand for every line, for every strain, sometimes people call them cultivars, what is it exactly doing, which pathways is it affecting, and what beneficial effects it may or may not have. So, in other words, it's not just like, you know, anything you can grab in the store will solve the problem. No, it has to be studied. And of course, next step would be, and it's really critical step, to take these data, as we call them preclinical data, based on which we have done our strain selection. So we know why we, for example, recommend strain number four to undergo, for, uh, for example, out of the other ones. Uh, strain number four can undergo uh, further clinical studies for the potential to curb cytokine storm. Why? Because we see what is it doing in our experimental models, because what it's doing is it's logical and it's actually really kind of mechanistically explained. Whereas line 12, of course, no, we, we don't want to have line 12, most certainly. And on the next slide is essentially the summary of the potential of cannabis versus COVID, and we don't really know how this fight will go and who's going to win, but we really very much hope that uh, we can propose cannabis as an excellent adjunct therapy. Again, it is not proposed as a first-line treatment. It is an adjunct therapy to complement currently existing therapies, and it can be done on two levels. First opportunity is to further explore the ability of cannabis extracts to block virus entry into the cells by interacting with ACE2 receptor and TNPRSS2. So essentially trying to block the receptor that brings it in transiently for preventative strategies as well as for treatment potential. And the other opportunity is trying to block the hyperreaction of the immune system, the cytokine storm, where we know that cannabis extracts, some cannabis extracts can decrease the levels of TNF, interleukins, and other molecules that are, you know, driving that storm. And by doing so, by adding these specific extracts, we can hope to curb inflammation and to prevent lung injury and organ failure and death. And again, one important thing is what we need, we do need clinical trials. And that is why we try to you know, reach out, we try to uh, talk about our findings, reach out to partners, to clinical partners, to industrial partners, and say, we need to have randomized control trials set up in such a way that we, we figure out whether or not, you know, these strains withstand the scrutiny of the bona fide, you know, full randomized control trial. And if they do, then they can be brought into the evidence-based medicine realm. Then we can say, yes, it actually really does what we hope to do. And, you know, it can be added to the current, uh, you know, re regimens that I use to combat COVID. On the next slide, it pretty much summarizes overall what else are we doing because, again, you know, we haven't been working directly on COVID. It was to a certain degree luck and to a certain degree serendipitous discovery because we already had so much data after we've done so much work. Because what we focused on previously were cancer, brain, you know, brain health, and you know, anything has to do with CNS, skin disorders, and inflammation. And what we do, we primarily go and do what we call preclinical testing in order to select the best strains and inform the generation of clinical trials where, of course, we'll be looking at safety, toxicity, tolerability, quality of life in cancer patients, for example, extremely important because it is known to reduce pain, to reduce anxiety, to increase appetite, and potentially even looking at disease improvement, uh, whereby we would say, okay, if we are curbing the inflammation, in case, for example, of our rheumatoid arthritis, then we are actually improving the disease course itself. And on the next slide is, again, we are pretty much zooming in into what we were planning on doing before COVID hit. And again, we were developing these strains through our expertise and through clinical testing. We were looking into special conditions and, you know, kind of in brain, we we're specifically looking into Parkinson's, dementia, stroke, and brain trauma 
skin diseases, skin age, and skin cancer all are very, very uh, important, you know, targets, potential targets for uh, cannabis therapies, inflammation-related disorders, as well, of course, as various cancers. But then, as I said, COVID hit, and but again, luckily, we already did have it, that database that we could screen and we could go through. And if we could go two slides back to cannabis versus COVID, if possible, just again, to summarize, the key take home messages from you know, today, from my talk today is that cannabis definitely can uh, offer some hope to become adjunct therapy for uh, COVID-19 disease. But cannabis is non-generic, and therefore it is very important that selection of strains is conducted rigorously based on preclinical data, based on mechanistic research, based on understanding of what do these specific strains do to the cells and to the tissues, and how they affect uh, processes that underlie those specific diseases. And of course, the next take home message is again, this because oftentimes people go and say, oh, you know, can I just go get in dispensary? No, because you never really know whether or not you're going to hit it or not. And it's not about all about just CBD. It's not about any given specific cannabinoid because cannabis extract has a lot of different cannabinoids and terpenes and they work together in the so-called entourage effect, potentiating the other. But again, the key take home message is Let's get fingers crossed. If we find the partners and conduct the trials, hopefully we will know whether or not they can. these uh, discoveries can be brought to the mainstream practice as, as evidence-based, again, as evidence-based medications that are used or are used as adjunct treatments. And on my last slide, I would like to thank people who participated in this research and my colleagues, my uh, my colleagues and our partners, we, the University of Lethbridge, of course, and the uh, our partners in biotechnology companies and plant biotechnologies, our partner in breeding, uh, 1500 um, new lines, possibly research or possibly RX is the biotech uh, spin-off we have, and as well as Swish specifically is the uh, R&D company specifically focusing on oral health. That uh, was their focus on oral health. We had some data uh, that actually let us understand the effects of cannabis on oral tissues. So again, those are the acknowledgements. I thank you for inviting me to give this talk and maybe just so that we can keep it as a background if need be, we can put that slide, slide 17 cannabis versus COVID for the rest of Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Olga, for that wonderful talk. Um, we have quite a lot of um, questions already in the queue so I will start reading them out to you and um, the first question come from, comes from Dana Daniels can a multi successful strain of cannabis be created to increase the efficacy of a single type of cannabis extract Dana thank you so much for, for the question you know, quite quite an interesting thing, multipotent strain. And to tell you the truth, um, we may have some that we will call multipotent. So out of the strains that we are now looking at, we're trying to identify the strains that affect all three in context for now in context of COVID. Let's just put it in context of COVID. Uh, identify the strains that number one affect ACE2 expression in all tissues, as well as affect the cytokine storm. And I do not want to put the, you know, the carriage way ahead of the horse, but it looks like we may have several. And so now we are, again, trying to confirm these data so that we can move forward on those. Because, of course, in the ideal world, you want either a multi-portal strain or you may want to have a combination of several, but if that's the other uh, stuff we oftentimes are doing, we are also testing combinations. Extract one, for example, versus extract, I don't know. 75 and we'll see okay this one works like this this one works like that do we have the synergy so we also test the synergy between them and identify either multipotent strain or a multipotent combination okay our next question comes from mark 
good all. How do you control the doses among your different strains? Could not be could not the differences be due to dosing problems because certain strains are more productive of certain compounds? That is an excellent question. We control, uh, first off, we control the dose and we, we apply to our tissues, to our tissues. The first level of control is we're trying to apply the same amount of extract uh, and can, you know, the same amount of extract going in. Then there are ways we can also and we were thinking about it, should we adjust, for example, by the level of CBD? But that would be, if we're doing so, then we are implying that CBD is the main component. And in the first paper that is there in preprint, we see that we used only high CBD lines, and they had very similar ratios of CBD to THC. So their concentrations, for example, of CBD would be almost the same, but the effects were different. So something else in the extract is playing a role. So again, we are trying to, um, for, in the, primarily in the first place, we are trying to adjust to give the same amount of extract. And yes, we are very, we understand that different extracts have different components in them. And once we identify the most potent ones, then we try to understand what's in it and kind of what could be the drivers behind it. And oftentimes it's not a single molecule, it's actually several. Okay, our next question comes from Henny Mondo. Hi Olga, any estimate, any estimate when you could start clinical trials, assuming fundings are in place? Oh, Henning, thank you so much for the great question. And for example, if I were to have, I don't know, $500,000, that's roughly give or take the, the good bona fide clinical trial price is on the you know account today, uh, I would say then the next step would be, of course, you know, talking to clinical co colleagues, but there is a lot of interest. Assuming that, you know, if we have clinicians on board, it takes about a good month to prepare a protocol. And the other thing would be how quickly will Health Canada approve it because it goes for Health Canada to Health Canada for approval. We have heard, uh, you know, my husband and my colleague in research, Igor, uh, he reached out actually to Health Canada asking what are the timelines now. And uh, the response was that usually on anything COVID related, on applications that are COVID related, they try to give it a two weeks turnaround time, which is really very, very short because the usual uh, clinical trial application gives several months. And then of course, any, again, it has to go through ethics board reviews. So I would say it would be realistic Again, you know, if I already had money in the bank, and if I have money in the bank, easier for, you know, um, clinics to commit because they will say, okay, now we, we have the funding. Why would I commit if you don't have the funding, right? So, so assuming that and assuming everything goes as planned and there are no roadblocks anywhere, delays, I would always give it one month for delays. I would say two to three months. But again you know, how, how things are. Okay. Funding is the biggest issue. Okay. Uh, next question is from, would a side effect of strain number four be arthritis? Mm, uh, thank you for the question, Beth. Actually, quite opposite. A strain, no, strain number four, uh, if anything, will cure arthritis because strain number four down-regulates uh, tumor growth factor alpha, interleukins, and all of the other molecules that actually are also driving arthritis, not only uh, cytokine storm. So everything that was in green, strain number four will downregulate it. So it actually is an excellent strain for arthritis. Uh, originally, if if not for COVID, because COVID came like in you know, like a joker and mixed up everybody's cards and just totally messed up the plans, we we're actually working and putting a protocol for it for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And some of those strains were actually considered for the formulation for the RA trial for the capsules that will go for rheumatoid arthritis trial. So quite opposite. Whereas strain number 12 that was bringing everything up could, again, potentially based on there, potentially exacerbate it. So as soon as everything goes up, interleukin is up, that's when the problem is. Okay. Our next question is from 
Amber Morrison Fox. Is CBD the active mechanism that you're working with? If so, is there a link between CBD and THC? Does CBD work well independently? Really great question, Amber. Um, CBD is an important component, but CBD is not the answer. In the first paper, in the first one that talks about ACE2, in the paper we have a table of all the strains that were used, and we have CBD to THC ratios in those strains. And in that paper we used only high CBD strains, and some of them were actually classified as CBD hemp because they had less than 0.3% of THC uh, per gram weight. So, and there we, for example, we had some strains that were 1 to 27, 1 to 21 THC to CBD, and one strain that is 1 to 21 works and the other strain that's 1 to 21 doesn't. So they have the same amount of CBD and a very comparable amount of THC, but one works and the other one doesn't, which proves that CBD is not the answer. We did comparisons of our extracts to CBD, to pure CBD, to CBD alone, and we could say that many extracts actually are way more potent than CBD alone. CBD alone did have some effects, so we're preparing the, pre the publication right now. But um, in some of our in some of our experiments, the extracts actually were up to ten times better than CBD alone. In cancer, most certainly there were extracts that were ten to fifteen times better than CBD alone. And even here, we had a lot of extracts that were much better than CBD alone. So CBD, yes, it's hailed as like all oh, the molecule of the year. <laughs> so. But the beauty of cannabis is, again, the entourage effect, the terpenes, the minor cannabinoids that work together and can potentiate CBD or other cannabinoids. Then there is also CBC, there is CBG, there is CBN. They all are, you know, working in concert. Okay. Our next question, it comes from Knut Peterson. Are you collaborating with other researchers in Canada and or internationally? Uh, thank you so much. Great question. Uh, yes, of course we are. We have put forward actually several uh, common grant applications. We work together. We put a consortium which includes colleagues from BC, Simon Fraser University, University of British Columbia, University of Saskatchewan. We work very closely with the University of Calgary and uh, again on COVID, but also we worked with them and continue working on other diseases like such as cancer, as well as rheumato rheumatological diseases and as well as uh, Field of dermatology, and we do have very uh, strong interest from. Uh, actually, when the preprints were published, uh, we we got a lot of interest from colleagues from around the globe. So, and we are even today we have several um, discussions with colleagues from California, with colleagues from Colorado, uh, internationally, colleagues from Italy, colleagues from. From Israel, we actually have very good collaboration with Israel. They have a lot of research going on. So, and again, the notion is that first we'll run a phase two trial and then we'll try to do an international trial. We also have very strong collaborations with um, with Asia, with uh, colleagues in uh, in Thailand who are very interested in again in developing uh, cannabis-based medicines, and as well as colleagues. Um, uh, I believe some colleagues who reached out to us were from Cambodia, from China, and so there is a global interest and we already had collaborations and we will get even more, hopefully now. Um, our next question comes from Christy Turton. Would the end viable product you perceive be the extract or is there a need for further research to determine which cannabis derived compounds are given are giving the wanted cellular response. Christy, this is a really interesting question and we have been thinking along these lines for quite some time. Uh, and again, you know, if you were right here, we could probably even discuss it in between us saying, uh, I think that, and this is what the, the trials will be focused on, uh, in, 
we will be going for an extract, and the extract will be given in those pill forms. Alternatively, if we are going for uh, other bad type of uh, applications through the medical inhaler, not through the any breathing. So, you know, uh, med, uh, you know, proper medical flavoring. Uh, but of course, it is always very interesting and important to try to identify the key components. But it doesn't look like it's going to be one or two or three. It's most probably several. And we are doing some what we call reconstitution experiments um, with some of the key cannabinoids, some of the key terpenes. But immediately what we not realize, oftentimes we start losing that effectiveness. And that becomes a trade-off of how much effectiveness are you willing to lose over making it kind of you know easier for um, you know if it goes as a product for market penetration. So if we, for example, create a product that only has three components, much easier. It becomes actually much easier than with whole plant extracts. But whole plant extracts work much better. So we will still, we're still exploring both routes, starting with whole plant extracts. And then if we hit something that we identify, the key components that create that synergy, that of course will be much easier moving forward. Good. Um, Henning Mundell has another question. As a plant breeder, um, and in the brackets while well retired, I would like to know where do you get your cannabis lines from for your testing? Where is the breeding done? Okay, Henning, you know what? You never retire from being a scientist. <laughs> I think you will agree with me. <laughs> so, and I mentioned that. Uh, the, uh, so Igor is the breeder in our family. He is now unfortunately, uh, you know, and, and he's busy with the other several arrangements. So he has the uh, has been working on the health scandal license for several years, and so essentially it's him and his lab, and together with Implanta Biotechnology, are doing the breeding, crossing different cannabis lines, even marijuana lines, different hemp lines, so creating hybrids characterizing them and as soon as of course you know it's a breeding under you realize aha uh -huh, this one has really interesting characteristics you try to keep it or try to further cross something else in again so that's where the breeding is done and right now we have about 1500 different strains but again that's over several years of work okay Beth Mundo, hi Olga Thanks so much for agreeing to speak at SACPA. Inflammation research, particularly on asthma, would be so beneficial. Thank you, Beth. I absolutely agree. And actually, quite interesting, we originally, before COVID hit, we didn't uh, focus on asthma. We were focusing on inflammation, as I showed on this slide, uh, on arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis. But then when this hit, and of course, we started looking into it, and I thought, yes, absolutely, asthma and COPD are absolutely you know, definitely are most interesting. And it's interesting in two aspects. And oftentimes people ask, and I'll kind of reiterate, uh, people will send us a, an email or call and say, well, you know what, I'm, I am using cannabis recreation, I'm smoking it, does this mean I will be doing much better? It's like, first off, this research was not done to show the effects of smoking. It was designed to to actually mimic or create preclinical data for bona fide clinical applications, which are usually either through capsules or through nebulizers. Uh, that being said, for asthma, we realized that there would be an, a way to actually deliver uh, these extracts, and we are trying to work with to make sure that they are not, fat, because usually they're fat soluble, we need to make sure they are water soluble so that they can be safely delivered to the upper respiratory tract to, um, to curb asthma attack and to curb that inflammation, because uh, from our original studies, we could see that there definitely is a potential. And I think once COVID is over, and I firmly believe it will be over because there's so much 
brain power that ours going towards how to fight it. Uh, we will then use what we have created and build further ways to manage COPD and uh, to manage asthma, COPD and uh, other types of lung diseases. To that effect, I'm actually very, very interested in lung fibrosis uh, because some of these lines, some of the extracts actually show very strong antifibrotic effects. And as you know, lung fibrosis is actually it's virtually incurable. So the, the only cure we know of for it is lung transplant. So they can be further explored. And I think a lot of new research will stem from this. Okay. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Regarding possible funding for uh, further research, are we talking provincial or federal support? Oh, Knud, that is a painful aspect. We are talking, let's put it this way, any support? Because uh, I should tell you, some of the very, very last ones, like we purchased some of the um, tissues, and it's on my credit card. So and the funding is really dry right now, and both federally and provincially, and we try to keep applying, but the, of course, application pressure is really huge. and. One other thing that always is a tiny bit painful, and that is why I'm actually really help, happy to talk to SACPA about uh, and to overall engage with public, there is still a bit of stigma associated with it. You know, people say, oh, cannabis. You know, we don't say, oh, opium poppy, because we all know the, you know, hydromorphone and, you know, all sorts of codeine, morphine, you name it, right? And that's derived from opium poppy, and that is used for pain control. And here we have another plant that has so much benefits to be explored for medicinal purposes. But during the years of prohibition, it was essentially labeled bad for whatever reason. So, and therefore, there is still a little bit of that you know, stigma associated with it, which unfortunately oftentimes even spills into research. So we always have to show extra, you know, go an extra mile and show, you know, extra data set to prove that, look, we actually really do have something. Because it looks like people will much easier put, uh, you know, what was called was put into clinical trials like this. Uh, it's used against gout disease, but it is a mitotic spindle poison essentially a very, very harsh drug. It was put like this in clinical trials of um, against cytokine storm. And kind of even though side effect profile is by far not comparable to any side effect profile that is specific if we're talking CBD cannabis, it's, it's safe. It's called grass, generally regarded as safe modality. So there is there are no potential side effects such as long-term potential of developing malignancies. Most certainly not, but that is a tiny bit of an issue. And again, we are applying, we are knocking at every door, we are applying at every grant opportunity. And in our research office, our, our research services have been extremely helpful. Oftentimes this comes at very short notice. Government announces something and the deadline is in week. And you think, oh my God, but I have to do it. So, and. We are knocking at every door and hopefully one door will open. Okay. Our next question comes from Amber Morrison Fox. I watched Igor's talk on matching cannabis with blood types for specific outcomes. Would the COVID related drug in development be for all people or would it be a blood type targeted too? And then she follows that up with another one, um, another message saying, or would it be something more like Side effects of prescription pill. Oh, I see, Amber. This is a really great, uh, great question. So, absolutely, in the f matching every drug to it, an individual is the penultimate goal of essentially of medicine, right? So, because we all are different, right? And our our bodies are function differently. We eat different things. So, and matching each drug, cannabis or not, to each person would be the penultimate goal. Same thing for cannabis, finding the best strain. That being said, uh, what we will do here for COVID, and usually, usually you know, personalized medicine or precision medicine is the next step over what we call evidence-based medicine. 
for COVID, we first have to create that evidence-based medicine realm within within um, cannabis and cough, whereby we will identify the strains that work and let them go through the clinical trials and see what is what is the effect. Within the clinical trial, we very much hope that participants fingers crossed will consent to identifying biomarkers of response. So within that clinical trial, we will be able to identify because I, you know, it's any, with any drug, there will be people who will respond and people who will not. And we hope that there will be majority of responders, but there still will be non-responders. And then we will identify what does it, what is it that makes a person a responder versus a, what is it there that makes a person non-responder that could then be used in that next level of personalization and say, aha, uh -huh, because of this marker, you probably are very likely to respond to this, so take it. Whereas if we'll say, mm, because you have this marker, you probably need to have something extra to make you respond. But again, this is, as I call it, you know, two tiers. First tier is evidence-based, and then next one is a precision medicine. So we are moving towards that, and we will be there. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Is the present COVID-19 pandemic presenting you with special difficulties to actually do the research? You know, Knut, this is a very interesting time for all of us. It presents difficulties, but it also presents opportunities. Of course, there are difficulties because, for example, only very limited personnel can be in the laboratory and we have to have certain permission and with all the social distancing that has to be, uh, you know, kept up. That's very, very important. And we take it seriously and so does the University of Cambridge. Uh, and of course, there are some other people who are not involved in this research. They cannot be in the laboratory. So that creates a problem and we try to work closely with our graduate students, with our postdocs, specifically with grad students because I'm very, very concerned about how their programs are, you know, progressing. That's very important. But on the other hand, it also created an opportunity for us to see whether or not our results can be applied elsewhere whether we can cross the boundaries of discipline. So now we've ventured into kind of into virology, essentially, built new collaborations, broadened our horizon. So again, with every crisis, there is an opportunity to learn. And we try to take it positively from that standpoint. Okay. Mark Gödel's question, would not extracts be easier to market as general homeopathics without specific claims against COVID like many homeopathics in the present market? Uh, this is an interesting question. Homeopathics, so extracts are not homeopathics by default because homeopathics, as far as I'm not an expert on them, uh, homeopathics have a tiny, 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 tiny amount of working ingredient, right? Uh, so uh, actually oftentimes fairly concentrated uh, working ingredients. And um, Extracts and overall not available, right? Everywhere. So it's available. You go to dispensaries. Uh, you can, you know, buy them OTC in dispensaries if you're of certain age, or you go to a clinic and they'll prescribe you something. You'll get something. But you cannot really ascribe any claim because these ones. Uh, actually, none of the strains that are being marketed have any special claim attached to it. So, and what we want to do, we want to bring it out of that realm of, you know, not homeopathic, but you know, some sort of a natural remedy which may or may not work, into the evidence-based re realm where actually physicians are comfortable working with it. So whether um, for example, they will say, okay, now we know which strain, what is it doing? And I think this is probably the way to go. And this is how, from, from attending the conferences, I can see globally the um, cannabis field wants to move. What they say, we're trying to move from farm to pharma, from medical grade cannabis to pharmaceutical grade cannabis. Because now we do have medical cannabis access. What we need, we need actually pharmaceutical grade, studied, trialed, and with clear, you know, indications and uh, ways of use. Okay. It's not easier to market, though. It's not easier to market. <laughs> it's much harder, yes. But we are not here for easy solutions. 
Our last question today comes from Raymond Smith. Thanks, Olga, for COPD. How would you administer a treatment if possible? Uh, thank you very much for your question, Graham. So for COPD, we were talking with some of the colleagues uh, and one of my really good collaborators is uh, actually uh, a special respirologist and uh, pulmonolo pulmonology specialist. There will be two ways. In one way, of course, is orally. So, so essentially you take the pill and it works through your bloodstream. But the other way, and we are now exploring it, would be through either medical grade inhalers or medical grade nebulizers. But for those, what would be crucial for us to do, and that's what we are doing, trying to find the best way of creating aqueous solutions of the extracts, uh, because we don't want any oils. It's actually, you know, with this, you know, the story of vaping, it's, it's actually probably the oils that interfere with surfactant that caused an issue there. So, and that would be the second way or the combination of both. And we have been talking with some colleagues who are experts specifically in medical grade inhalers, like, like the ones like salbutamol comes in a medical grade inhaler, right? The dose ones and it creates a certain type of aerosol, not kind of, you know, not any combustion products or anything. But again, that has to be trialed. Okay, we have a final comment by Knut Peterson. Many thanks, Olga. Great job of explaining your research. Um, I also want to echo that. Thank you very much for being here today with us and doing this live uh, stream with us and explaining this really important research. I will now be signing off. Thank you very much for inviting me again and thank you for everybody for great questions and for your support. And again, to all of us, I wish it's just we all stay in good health, we all stay safe and let's think positive and, you know, and that too shall pass. That COVID thing shall pass and we'll get back to our normal, to having our lab, which is a great and vibrant community. Thank you.